May 1941. A storm rages in the Atlantic Ocean. A squadron of antiquated biplanes take on the most powerful warship the world has ever seen. Bismarck. It seemed almost incredible to me to watch these ancient looking planes flying against this fire spitting mountain. At stake, the future of Europe. If Bismarck succeeds in her mission, the convoy system will collapse and Britain will surrender. It really is the pivot point of the Second World War. Disasters don't just happen. They're a chain of critical events. Unravel the clues and count down those final seconds from disaster. The North Atlantic. May the 24th, 1941. British battleship HMS King George V. Commander-in-Chief of the British Home Fleet, Admiral John Tovey, is on the most important mission of his career. To sink a ship so powerful, it threatens Britain's very survival. Bismarck, the flagship of the German Navy. On her maiden voyage, she sails with cruiser Prince Eugen. Tovey sends a fleet to cut them off. Leading is battle cruiser HMS Hood, symbol of Britain's ocean supremacy and pride of the Royal Navy. She was a beautiful looking ship everywhere she went. I mean, she attracted the, the, the attention, and uh, we all loved her. Commander of the Hood is Vice Admiral Lancelot Holland. With the element of surprise, Holland is confident of success. Bismarck and Prince Eugen are 30 kilometers north of the Hood. Bismarck is the admiral of the German fleet, Gunter Lutjens, a legend in the German Navy, sinking 22 British ships in just two months. At first light, he sees HMS Hood closing in. Zwei schwere Kreuzer. Halten weiter für noch. The hood opens fire. Strangely, Lutyens gives no orders to return fire. It's the captain, Ernst Lindemann, who takes control. Fire fly! Shells rain down in the Denmark Strait. One salvo hits the hood. Pierces six decks of steel. And explodes in the ship's magazine. Detonating 300 tons of ammunition. The 
the huge ship splits in two and sinks in just two minutes. Over 1,400 sailors lose their lives, including Vice Admiral Holland. Bismarck sails on. The news of Hood's demise radios across the world. The greatest battle cruiser in the world was HMS Hood. Her complement was 1,341 officers and ratings. All our sympathy goes out to the relatives of those gallant men who lost their lives when a shell from the new German battleship Bismarck exploded a magazine. They came over the Tannoy that the hood had been sunk. And at that time, it was one of disbelief because we, we thought she was unsinkable and that there was no ship that could touch her. It's a matter of national importance. Bismarck must be sunk. Admiral Tovey calls on every available ship in the Royal Navy. British sailors face a daunting task. We knew that she was a formidable opponent and uh, most of her equipment was far superior to ours. With 88 guns, accurate over 35 kilometers, a top speed of 30 knots, and armor more than 30 centimeters thick, Bismarck is the most terrifying battleship ever built. Her mission, to starve Britain into submission. And her target, the merchant navy convoys bringing supplies into the UK. They were bringing over not only oil, but food, tanks and planes from America to help us, because we, at that particular time, were on our own. The British know Bismarck's objective is these convoys. It is paramount she is stopped. On board Bismarck, morale is high. Oh. The crew celebrates sinking HMS Hood with extra food and cigarettes. They head south into the Atlantic. Admiral Toby's fleet follow. Two ships have Bismarck within radar range. It's their job to track her through the night. But at four the following morning, Tovey receives bad news. Sorry, dismissed. The British cruiser, HMS Suffolk, has lost Bismarck from its radar screens. The German battleship is now at large somewhere in the Atlantic Ocean. We was on our way to intercept when we heard that they'd lost contact with her. she just slipped through the cordon uh, and was free. Spotter planes are launched and battleships scour the ocean. But they find nothing. Then, a stroke of luck for the British. 7 a.m., Admiral Luchens breaks radio silence. He sends an update to German Naval Command, which is picked up at listening stations across the UK.
Tovi has Luchens back on the map. He orders his fleet north. The chase is back on. But Bismarck is sailing south towards occupied France. Eleven hours later, there is still no sighting by the British fleet. The calculations are checked. The British have made a monumental blunder. They're sailing in the wrong direction. It's a tense few hours for Toby as his ship turns round and heads south in search of Bismarck. The Atlantic is a very lonely big place and uh, it would take a hell of a lot of patrolling, uh, to, you know, to find her again. May the 26th. An RAF Catalina plane spots the Bismarck. It was with great relief when we got the signal to say that she'd been sighted by the Catalina flying boat. Tovey can pinpoint the German ship. She is 18 hours from French waters and Luftwaffe support. He'll never catch her in time. His only hope lies with a fleet coming north from the Mediterranean. Among them, aircraft carrier HMS Ark Royal with a squadron of swordfish biplanes. With Bismarck just 14 hours from safety, Tovey orders an attack. These lightweight machines take off into stormy skies. They fly for one hour in atrocious conditions. Barely able to see each other, they rely on the lead plane's radar. There's a ship ahead. Aboard the British cruiser, HMS Sheffield, George Osborne watches the planes descend. All of a sudden I looked up and uh, I said to my pal, I said they're going to attack us and he told me not to be so daft. Unaware of the mistake, the pilots close in on one of their own ships. Torpedoes hit the water, armed with the latest magnetic detonators or pistols, and speed towards the Sheffield. Fortunately for us, the ones that hit had 40 pistols, which meant that the, the warhead couldn't explode. Bismarck is now four hours closer to French waters. Tovey learns of the botched mission. The weather deteriorates. Flying conditions are near impossible, but he has no choice. He orders another aerial attack. Crews struggle to arm and fuel the swordfish on a pitching deck. With the wind blowing at 70 kilometers per hour and the ship lurching from side to side, 15 swordfish take off in heavy skies. Bismarck 
is 10 hours from air support. All Toby can do is wait. It's a further two hours before the lead plane picks up the German ship. On board Bismarck, a gunnery officer, Lieutenant von Mühlenheim Rechberg, hears the swordfish approach. It seemed almost incredible to me to watch these ancient looking and obsolete planes almost hanging or standing in the air, flying against this fire spitting mountain. Ken Patterson is one of the pilots that day. We'd started our dive down to 90 feet, dropped the fish, turned hard downwind. As we turned away, my observer, he looked over the side of the aircraft, astern, and saw our torpedo actually running. A single torpedo strikes the rear of the ship. The steering mechanism stops responding. On my action station, there was a rudder indicator, and I looked there and looked, and I saw the rudder jam at port 10 and never move again. Bismarck is effectively dead in the water. The enormous rudders are stuck and cannot be freed by the crew. Just a few hours from safe waters, and the German ship is reduced to sailing slowly in large circles. Luchens and his crew can no longer outrun their enemies. As the reality of their situation sinks in, the mood on board becomes desperate. We all felt we were on the butcher's slab and there was nothing much we could do about that. Das deutsche Volk ist bei euch. Und wir werden schießen, bis die Rohre glühen und bis das letzte Geschoss die Rohre verlassen hat. Für uns Soldaten heißt es jetzt siegen oder sterben. The crew fear they cannot survive. Admiral Tovey can strike at any hour. To reduce the risk of friendly fire, he waits until morning. the 27th, the British open fire. George Bell watches the battle unfold from HMS Dorsetshire. We open fire at extreme range, something like about 16 miles. and uh, soon were seen to be hitting the target. Within minutes, a hit destroys the command bridge, and with it, Admiral Luchens. Even crippled, Bismarck is still a formidable threat. We heard the shells go over. I hadn't got the range of us, fortunately. The British ships close in. 
we fired 250 18 shells in that something like probably about an hour. Uh, it closed our range from uh, 16 miles to 2,000 yards. Despite 90 minutes of intensive bombardment, the German ship isn't sinking. Tovey turns to the Dorset ship, the only ship left with torpedoes. We fired two torpedoes at her, one which hit the Bismarck, but before we could fire the other one, she began to turn over. The Bismarck lists hard to port and capsizes. And you could see her keel from stem to stern, which was the full length of the ship, before she, uh, the stern dipped into the water and she went down. Bismarck has gone, sunk on her maiden voyage. Of the crew of 2,221, only 115 survive. In just four days, two of the biggest ships in the world have sunk, and three and a half thousand men have died. Now, by rewinding the events of 1941, we can reveal how the Third Reich's plan to starve Britain into submission was strewn with fatal errors. An opportunity for Germany to win the war in Western Europe is squandered. Seventy years on, naval historian Andrew Lambert will uncover how the series of miscalculations by Germany seals the fate of Bismarck. March 1941. Germany must defeat Britain for total domination of Western Europe. The island's survival depends on supplies crossing the Atlantic. Germany must sever that lifeline. The Nazis develop a two-pronged strategy. Erich Raeder, the commander of the German Navy, worked out a plan in which the submarines would force the British to use the convoy system. U-boats would force the ships to travel as a pack. Then, fast, powerful German battleships would ambush and sink these convoys. So the British would be caught on the horns of a dilemma. The convoy system itself was the target. If the British stopped convoying, they would lose the war. Germany has refined this plan since the outbreak of the war. In 20 months, they have successfully sunk six million tons of shipping. Now their top battleship is ready to wreak havoc in the Atlantic. This mission is called Operation Rhine. The original plan for Operation Rhine was to get out all of the available German heavy surface ships, the Bismarck, the Prinzwagen, the Scharnhorst, the Eisenhower, the Admiral Hipper, and possibly the Admiral Scheer as well. But before Operation Rhine is launched, there's a major setback. Most of the German battleships have been incapacitated. Unfortunately for them, the Scharnhorst and Eisenhower, their other two fast battleships, had come back from a convoy attack in the Atlantic and they'd been bombed and damaged at Brest in France and were not operational at this time. So instead of a surge of half a dozen powerful ships, the Germans end up sending out two. For Lambert, this decision is the first in a series of miscalculations. Having planned for a big operation, the Germans may have been wiser, with the benefit of hindsight, to have waited until they could have sent more ships out. But German confidence in their strategy overrules any sense of caution. This year alone, they've sunk 22 Allied ships. They get impatient. They think total victory is at hand. Once in the Atlantic, Bismarck and Prinz Eugen will hide in the vast ocean and sink the convoys by stealth. But first, they must navigate undetected around Britain. 
Again, they believe they have little reason for concern. The Germans had sent more than half a dozen missions into the Atlantic since 1939. Not one of them had been intercepted. So the Germans must have been fairly confident that this mission would get through as well. This is another miscalculation. The British are suffering from the German convoy campaign. They take the threat of a powerful battleship like Bismarck extremely seriously. If Bismarck gets out into the Atlantic and succeeds in her mission, the convoy system will collapse and Britain will surrender. It really is the pivot point of the Second World War. Bismarck, the largest battleship in Europe, must reach the Atlantic undetected. But Andrew Lambert believes that Germany fundamentally underestimated the British spy network. Because they occupied many countries, Denmark, Norway, France, Holland, Belgium, there were many people in those countries who were only too happy to pass intelligence to the British. It takes just 48 hours for news to reach the British. And then Bismarck and Prince Eugen stop in Bergen, Norway to refuel, giving the British a chance to locate her. So the British are already fixated on finding a ship. They know it's coming. They know where to expect it. And when it puts into Bergen, it's no surprise. British photo reconnaissance, Spitfire turns up right overhead and takes a picture of it. With this picture, Operation Rhine is compromised yet again. Unaware his movements are known, Admiral Luchens focuses on secretly slipping into the Atlantic. The weather takes a turn for the worse. It's the cover Luchens has been waiting for. He set sail before Bismarck's tanks are full, gambling that he'll be able to refuel later. I think it was a very good tactical choice. Getting into the Atlantic was the important thing. He had tankers in the Atlantic to refuel from. Uh, those last few hundred tons of oil fuel were far less important than getting through the Denmark Strait without being intercepted. But Luchens doesn't know his cover is already blown. He's sailing towards an ambush set by HMS Hood. It was now possible to put in place a plan that would secure an intercept on either side of Iceland. The interception of Bismarck as she tried to get into the Atlantic is exactly what the British planned. This puts Luchens in a difficult position. He's under direct orders to avoid engagement with the Royal Navy. It's the convoys they're after, not a sea battle. When Hood attacks, Luchens is frozen with indecision. He doesn't return fire. Then he's undermined by a low-ranking officer, the ship's captain, Ernst Lindemann. Jan Witt has found evidence of friction in their relationship. You have to take into consideration that they saw the operation from different points of view. So the captain of a vessel is responsible for the tactics. So uh, Lindemann was thinking tactically, while the Admiral had to think strategically. Luchens is focused on following orders. Lindemann's focus is the immediate future of his ship. He makes the unprecedented move to override his superior officer. So in the end, uh, Captain Lindemann ordered open fire uh, with the words, I won't have my ship shot off under my ass. The hood is sunk. But while Germany celebrates, Luchens is thinking further ahead. He takes no satisfaction in the triumph. What's interesting is that Luchens, far from being elated by his success, 
seems to have been depressed and demoralized by it because he realized that having sunk the pride of the Royal Navy, it was fairly likely that the British would keep coming until they'd finished. Luchens is aware the British will do their utmost to avenge the Hood. The destruction of the Hood is a morale catastrophe for the British, but it's not a disaster that leads to downheartedness. It leads to an, an instant desire for overwhelming revenge. To make matters worse, Bismarck has been damaged in the battle. A shell from um, the Prince of Wales had hit her bow. She was leaking oil, and uh, also her speed has been reduced. The leaking oil fuel slows the Bismarck, neutralizing one of its great advantages, speed. Luchin's gamble to leave before refueling is backfiring. Now he must roll the dice once more. He had to made up uh, or come up with a decision whether to break off this operation or to go ahead. At this critical moment, the strain between the senior officers shows again. There was an argument between the captain of the Bismarck, Lindemann and Admiral Lichens about uh, the question whether to go ahead or return to Norway. Lindemann wants to return to Norway. His priority is his ship. Lutjens is thinking of the greater mission. If Bismarck can reach occupied France, she can be repaired and poised on the edge of the Atlantic to attack British convoys. She wouldn't have to negotiate the treacherous Denmark Strait again. In the end, Lutjens overruled Lindemann and ordered going ahead, trying to reach the French ports. For Lambert, this decision is vital to the future of Bismarck. He could have gone home. He chose not to. That's a major, major mistake. Lutjens believes he can make the safety of France without being caught, even though he knows the British are on his tail. He can hear their radar signals, but he misunderstands the capabilities of this new technology. Lutjens was still hearing the radar emissions from HMS Suffolk, so as far as he was concerned, the British still knew where he was. What Lutjens doesn't understand is that the radar signals he can hear never make it back to the British because their ships are too far apart. At 3 a.m. on May the 25th, British ships lose radar contact. It's Luchin's chance to get to France safely. But then he makes a critical error. He decides to send this enormous, rather rambling Wagnerian signal back to Berlin and he gives the British a perfect opportunity to reconnect. Ironically, even though he has escaped, Luchens is contacting Germany to voice his concerns about their dire situation. He's not euphoric, he's not bombastic, he's not triumphant. He's depressed. The British are still out there. They're going to get me. They're going to track me down and sink me. When Luchens makes this call, he's over an hour ahead of the British fleet. He was free and clear. If he'd not sent that signal, the British would have had a hard time finding him. Luchin's mistake is grave, but then the British make an even worse one. They make a basic error in showing the course of the ship, and they show her heading north when she's heading south. Tovey is left with only one option. To challenge the mightiest, most advanced ship on the ocean, he turns to a collection of aging biplanes on HMS Ark Royal, the Swordfish. The Swordfish are remarkably old-fashioned looking airplanes. They're biplanes, they've got fairly small engines, the cockpit is open.
of this vast difference in technology between ship and plane becomes Britain's trump card. Bismarck's mighty anti-aircraft guns are too advanced for these antiquated planes. The German gunnery officer reported that their anti-aircraft systems couldn't be put on such a slow setting as the swordfish. They were expecting planes to fly at 150 miles an hour and the swordfish flew at 80. And so they were always firing too far ahead of the target. So they did very little damage to the swordfish and shot none down. All torpedoes are dropped. They race towards the heavily armored hull of Bismarck. But even the most powerful ship in the ocean has an Achilles heel. You have to understand that the rudder and the propellers are the weak point of every ship. There is literally no, no possibility to, to protect it by, by armor or something like that. Bismarck's only option is to try to outmaneuver the torpedoes. Captain Lindemann orders a sharp turn to port. His plan to dodge the approaching torpedo. But instead, he exposes the vulnerable steering mechanism. When the torpedo hit, the Bismarck was maneuvering. So it was simply bad luck that one of these torpedoes hit there. Bismarck's rudders turn to port. The fatal torpedo strikes. It detonates behind the steering gear room. Damage to this section jams the rudders. The force of the explosion sends a shockwave along the length of the ship. Bismarck is now unmaneuverable. The torpedo hit in the swordfish strike stops the Bismarck and sets up the final battle in which he'll be destroyed. It is the, the turning point of the whole chase. There isn't any more mistakes that can be made. They're going to be sunk. It's just a question of how long it takes. On the morning of May the 27th, Bismarck's fate is sealed. At 10.39, Bismarck slips beneath the waves. Her first mission lasted little more than a week. She sank Britain's biggest battle cruiser, an outmaneuvered enemy radar. But the world's most advanced ship is ultimately defeated by slow-moving and outdated aircraft. The operation was strewn with bad luck and fatal decisions. But Andrew Lambert believes that the greatest error was not made at sea. The mission was doomed before Bismarck left port, and the blame goes right to the top. Bismarck's fate was decided by a catalog of critical errors. May the 19th, eight days to disaster. She starts her mission without the fleet originally planned for. The following day, the Allied spy network blows the secrecy of the operation. She fails to fill her fuel tanks in Bergen. Three days to disaster. Luchens decides to head for France rather than return home. And then radios Berlin, disclosing his position to the British. 13 hours to disaster. A fatal maneuver during the swordfish attack results in her steering being disabled. Ten thirty-nine, on May the twenty-seventh, Bismarck six. For Andrew Lambert, the blame for the failure of the mission doesn't lie with Admiral Luchens. He believes the reason lies deeper with the Fuhrer himself. 
Adolf Hitler's intervention in the, the Bismarck sortie is relatively limited. He really isn't desperately interested in the Navy. Uh, he's certainly not interested in this particular bit of the war. Hitler's war until now has been focused on total supremacy in Europe. The British are the sole survivors in the West. They are alone. Russia and America have yet to join the war. While Germany is victorious on land, Britain battles hard in the air and on the waves. The German Navy believe that if they can control the Atlantic, Britain will crumble. Bismarck is perfect for this strategy. The battleship Bismarck was the first full-scale battleship Germany had built since the First World War. So it's quite clearly a very important statement about the country and its identity. It was a, a symbol of Nazi Germany. But although Hitler appreciates the need for big, powerful ships like Bismarck, he's uncomfortable with naval warfare. Hitler never understood the ocean. He was not a natural seafarer. He was, after all, an Austrian. Uh, he comes from a landlocked part in Central Europe. So for him, the great sweep of the ocean and, and the war on the ocean is, is alien territory. And at this point in the war, defeating Britain is not his main aim. Hitler's focus is on the east. His aim, to invade Russia. For Germany, the event of May 1941 is not the Battle of the Atlantic. It's Operation Barbarossa. Hitler is entirely fixated on assembling an enormous army and destroying the Soviet Union by the end of the year. If Hitler invades Russia, he'll be fighting on two fronts, west and east. His army will be divided and weakened. He wants the Western Front closed down. The German Navy believe that Bismarck can provide the solution. The best way to make the British stop fighting is to destroy their convoy system. So the Navy is able to sell its pet project at a time when it just might solve Hitler's main problem, the two-front war. Operation Rhine gets the go-ahead. In their haste to prove their new battleships, their mission begins without Hitler's knowledge. But the real problem for Bismarck is that Hitler's attention is already on Russia. And the backup the operation needs is focused elsewhere. For the Nazi leadership, apart from the Navy, they're all looking east, they're not looking west. So Operation Rhine is not going to get Air Force support that it might want. It's not going to be tied into other operations. So the Bismarck is operating with very little support, even from the submarine force. Britain had controlled the whole empire through mastery of the waves. But Hitler ignores this lesson. Bismarck leaves woefully under-supported. Eight days later, she is gone. And then next day, came the glorious news that the Bismarck had been sunk. From the moment Churchill announced the sinking of the Bismarck in the House of Commons, there was an enormous sense of relief. This is the darkest moment in Britain's Second World War. And the successful destruction of the Bismarck is absolutely critical to overall Allied victory. That one week in May 1941 was pivotal to the Second World War. If Bismarck had succeeded and Britain surrendered, there would have been no bridgehead for the Anglo-American liberation of Europe. When Bismarck sank, the Germans lost their opportunity to beat Britain and ultimately win the war. Second from Disaster is back at the same time tomorrow. Stay tuned for Save the Titanic with Bob Ballard.